and welcome to the Her Business Podcast, the show for women growing and scaling a business. I'm Susie Daphnis, CEO at Her Business, and I'm so glad you're here. We just wrapped up a big project this last weekend, and to be honest, I'm still recovering. (laughs) The team and I have been working really hard for the last few months to prepare for opening the doors to the Her Business Network, something we only do publicly once a year, and the doors just closed this last weekend after a week of being open. So we have a wonderful cohort of business owners who've joined us, and they're from around Australia and different parts of the world, and we are thrilled to have them. This is episode 117 of the podcast. And this podcast, just like our network, is for women who want to go from being a solopreneur to growing and scaling a business. I am so thrilled to have you here because today we're going to be talking about doing work that makes you come alive. And what I know is that I do what I love every single day. It wasn't always that way, (laughs) but uh, after a, a few lessons in the early years of business, I designed the business so that I was doing what I feel I'm here on the planet to do. So when I heard this message from our guest, Jonathan Fields, I knew that I wanted to share this with you. Because if you've ever wondered if the path you've chosen is right for you, imagine being able to figure out what kind of work will fill you with a sense of purpose and meaning and let you fully express yourself and your gifts and your passions and your skills and drop you into that transcendent state of flow where you just know deep down that you're doing the work that you were put here to do. Sound a little woo-woo? It's not. This is about connecting with what your heart really wants and what your skills are and work that makes you, that sparks you, that lights you up, that makes you come alive. So before we get our guest on the show, I do want to thank one of our fabulous listeners who left this review on Apple Podcasts. Her name is Christy Lee Billet of the Footprint Group, and she says, so much gold. Thank you, Susie. As always, you provide so much great information for business owners through this podcast. Loving the amazing line of interviews, but what I love most is the practical advice and information you provide as to how we can implement these ideas into our own businesses. Christy Lee is the leader of the Footprint Group, which is a dynamic mix of specialist services providing people-based solutions to Central Coast businesses and increasingly businesses all over the country. I know Christy Lee works with a number of our members, helping them recruit the right people for the right roles and making sure that when they're, whether they're hiring or firing, that they're complying with the regulations and not getting themselves into trouble. So whether you need a full-time person or you want to hire a contractor, I recommend that you check out the Footprint Group. She does work remotely with people all over the country. Um, And I know all this about Christy Lee because she's a member of the Her Business Network. Um, So when you leave your review, no matter who you are, firstly, number one, thank you. But number two, tell me your business name so that I can give you a shout out. Sometimes people will leave reviews under, you know, three hats 95. And it's like, it's hard for me to promote you (laughs) when that is the name that you leave. So be sure to tell me who you are so I can give you a shout out. Now, let me tell you about my guest. As I mentioned earlier, his name is Jonathan Fields. Um, He is a dad, a husband, an entrepreneur, an award-winning author, and he's uh, the founder of the mission-driven media and education company called Good Life Project. His podcast, which is one of the top ranked, is called Good Life Project as well. And he has incredible guests. You really want to check it out. It's one that I listen to regularly. Uh, He gets millions of downloads and he's got a global audience and his uh, guests are, you know, international names that you will love. Plus, he, you know, he has helped me discover so many authors and incredible minds um, listening to his podcast. Anyhow, his latest creation is Sparkotypes. And this is a set of archetypes that are designed to reveal the source code, he says, for the work that you're here to do. Now, in the interview, you're going to hear how to discover the imprint for the work that makes you come alive and what the clues are when you're doing the work that you are really here to do and when you're not and how to feel more on purpose and fully expressed while doing meaningful work. We're also going to look at the pathway to more connection and more joy, doing work that sparks you and looking at what it looks like to live into your full potential. Sound good? We're going to go to the interview now, and then after the interview, we're going to look at some practical ways to put these lessons to work in your business. Jonathan, hi and welcome. Ah, Thanks for having me here. I am so excited to talk about doing work that makes us come alive. What more could we want? (laughs) Tell me what is typically going on when we find ourselves asking, what should I be doing with my life? 
Uh, usually a whole lot of uh, discontent at, at that particular point in time. Um, but you know what I found is that so many of us reach a point in our lives where we start to ask that question. When we start to feel like we've invested a whole bunch of our energy, time, sometimes resources, money in building in a particular direction, and we realize that the way we hoped we would feel mm. when we started to travel down that path and the way we do feel are two very different things. And as the pain of the difference between reality and expectation begins to grow and deepen, and we feel that more persistently on a day-to-day -day basis, then we start to wonder, did I make the right choice? Is there a different choice I could make moving forward? Um, and if so, what do I do about it? And um, But I think fundamentally underneath all of that, mm. the real source is that while we go to school and we generally get a, an education for a particular field or domain, or maybe it's bio or computer science or political science or whatever it may be, we get knowledge about a particular field, um, but we're never really put through a process of self-inquiry, of self-discovery for ourselves. You know, there's no undergraduate degree in self-discovery. Um, and I think, you know, it's, it's really a bit of a shame because that means that when we do reach that point um, where we have to make a decision, you know, like what comes next, whether it's after college, whether it's five or 10 or 15 or 20 years out, um, we don't actually have the tools. We don't know ourselves well enough to really understand in an intelligent way what to say yes or no to. So I think a lot of the frustration that we tend to feel is in part that we realize we're not doing the thing we feel we're here to do, but also in part, we feel ill-equipped to figure out what that thing is, what to say yes or no to. Mm, I love that. Um, had there been a course on um, self-awareness, I think I would have raised my hand. I think I've created my own diploma in my own, <laughs> with my own life's path. Uh, but I, I agree. And especially as, I mean, I had no idea what I wanted to do when I left school. And so, you know, family circumstances had me go down one path and I've re-examined that many times. And so even if, you know, we, we, we go, we decide on a profession, we then branch out into our own business, which is pretty much the community that's watching this. We have our own business and whether we've just started and we're one or two years in or whether 20 years back we're looking, we might find ourselves in this cycle of stress, working really, really hard, totally overwhelmed and on this treadmill, treadmill excuse me, and not feeling at all jazzed up about our business. What do we do at that point? Yeah, I mean, um Man, I, I cannot tell you how many conversations I've had with founders over the years who have left a job in the name of striking out on their own and building this thing that was just the fullest expression of who they were, of freedom, of control, and then found themselves a couple of years down the road having built a company that very often the outside world considers a success, yes. yet they hate going into because they have essentially recreated the same cage that they left but now there's no one to blame but themselves. <laughs> um, and I think, uh, a, again, a lot of this happens because um, we will keep repeating patterns um, in, in less than until we know ourselves well enough to understand what exactly is it that empties us, what exactly is it that fills us, mm -hmm. so that when we do make that next move, whether it's as an entrepreneur, as a founder, or into another company, um, we can create something different. So, you know, like, I'm, I'm a multi-time entrepreneur as you are, as it sounds like so many of um, your, your community is. And so I'm sure that, that I, I am not the only one who has done this to myself. <laughs> um, you know, I've, I've sold a number of companies and you know, in part because I, I built them to a point where my interest shifted, but also because as in my own learning journey, I would come to a point where I realized, okay, I've built something that appears and is by all you know, like traditional measures outwardly successful, profitable, doing well, and yet it's not giving me what I thought I wanted. And it keeps dropping me into this cycle of, okay, so last time I explored who I am and what matters, what did I miss? And how do I go deeper? And how do I start to look at different metrics, some non-traditional things, or are there things that I've never even heard about like you know, that I can integrate to really figure out who am I and what matters to me so that as I continue to iterate and create new things and build new things, um, they become more more closely aligned with 
who I am. You know, to me, I'm always looking for the sweet spot between purpose, engagement, and expression. Meaning, you know, I'm looking to live and act and build business in that sweet spot where I feel like I'm on purpose. I feel like the reason I'm here is is the driving force behind what I'm doing. Where I feel like on a day to day basis, um, the actual things that I do, the tasks, the tools, the processes, are are things that allow me to um, tap the best selves in myself and that who I am, my identity, my preferences, my the essence of who I am um, is fully expressed in what I do so that I don't feel stifled. So for me, you know, it's been a journey to just continually go deeper and go deeper and go deeper and mine those parts of myself and then had the, you know, the, the pleasure of working with so many other people over the years and learning from so many other people to try and figure out, like, how do we find that space and how do we, how do we really elicit those deeper drivers? Mm. And you've kind of now uh, decided to take us on your journey in a different way for us to uncover what you call is an imprint for the work that we do that actually does make us come alive, that has us feeling on purpose. Can you tell us how we, how do we start to grasp that thread? Yeah. So it's funny, if, if you had asked me five, ten years ago whether um, any given person has sort of a, a singular purpose purpose through line people use the word life purpose i feel like that's such a loaded phrase that it just immediately triggers you know a lot of so i, I kind of stay away from that as a general rule but if i think about it as your your life's work dna or a deeper source code or imprint that really um is your reason for being you know the the french call it your raison d'etre the the japanese would call it your ikigai which essentially is your reason for jumping out of bed in the morning Mm-hmm. And so I started doing a lot of research on on purpose and these these much deeper level drivers. What I realized is that there there exist two worlds. There was the world of academia where there's some really fascinating research, and then there's the world of metaphysics where there's some interesting process. But the world of academia very often does not translate or apply very readily to just everyday life. You know, how do we actually use this wisdom? And the world of metaphysics very often requires you to buy into a whole set of beliefs that pushed a lot of people away. There wasn't a lot of just practical, vetted, validated process. Mm-hmm. What I start to realize is that when you ask any given per, you know, person uh, what their purpose is, very often you get this really surface level answer. You know, um, I help uh, middle-aged men reclaim their confidence after some sort of devastating loss. And that's wonderful. And that may in fact be somebody's purpose. Maybe that's a mm-hmm. coach who focuses on that. But what you really, you know, start to realize is that is a time limited, granular expression of something deeper. Because at some point, your interest is going to shift, your circumstance is going to shift, and you won't be able to actually do that anymore. And if and when that happens, you'll find yourself adrift. You'll find yourself without a sense of identity and purpose. So I started really saying, okay, so if you start with that sentence, and then you start to ask, and what's driving that? And then you go, and what's driving that? And what's driving that? over and over, you get down, you, you quickly go from 7.5 billion unique sentences to 10 fairly universal imprints. Um, and this is sort of the source code level answer. And I found that when you get the answer on that level, this is what I call a sparkotype, the archetype that sparks you. When you get to that level, it gives you freedom because once you know the deeper source code, it's like you know your DNA. Your mm-hmm. DNA can be expressed, turned on, turned off in thousands of different ways thousands of different careers, businesses, roles, titles. Um, When you have that, it gives you freedom to actually say yes to a universe of worlds and understand why you're saying yes and why you're saying no, so that you can really start to build um, a company or a job, whatever it is that's gonna really drive you in a way that allows you to feel alive on a day-to-day basis. You know, find and live in that sweet spot between purpose, engagement, and expression. And this tool for this expression, for this expressing who we are and each day, you know, jumping out of bed to be who we truly are, um, this is what you call the sparkotypes, these archetypes that spark you. Would you introduce us to this, I think, incredible tool uh, that will give each of us just more freedom and that knowing that we are on purpose, which is what it did to me when you introduced this to me? Yeah, I'm, I'm happy to. So we, we've spent a lot of time um, building an assessment, which 
I learned through the process is incredibly hard to do. <laughs> and, <laughs> the idea was how do we actually build an assessment that is truly robust, uh, universal across nearly any individual, any culture, wherever you come from, and that can somebody can spend a relatively short amount of time answering a series of questions, and it will at the end give you a profile, which actually is 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 two different sparker types. So your profile is what I would call your primary sparker type. And that fundamentally identifies the work that you're here to do. This is the thing that wakes you up in the morning. And when you can spend the vast majority of your time doing it, everything else just kind of falls where it needs to fall. And then we have what we call your shadow sparker type. Now, this is kind of interesting because it's work that you're very likely pretty accomplished at. You probably enjoy on some significant level. And um, But if you're really, really being honest, it's the work that you do in the name of being able to do the work of your primary spark type better. So I'll give you an easy example so you can That'd understand. That'd be great. Hmm. So for me, my spark type profile is the maker as my primary. And that spark type, the fundamental work of the maker is to make ideas manifest. So I wake up in the morning and like many entrepreneurs, I just, I walk down the street and I'm like, I could build something for that. I can <laughs> write this. I can produce this. And I'm just, all I want to do is I have ideas dropping left and right. My team sometimes calls me an idea terrorist because I constantly have things and I'm bringing them to the team and they're like, slow down. Um, so, so that's my primary spark type. Now that has shown up since the time I was a small kid. I grew up in a small town outside of New York City where I live right now. And we were in one of those towns where we had the old school junkyard. And every Sunday, I would get my parents to drive me down, open up the back of the truck, and throw in parts of discarded bicycles where I would bring them home. And I would get a roll of duct tape and just start to tape the pieces together and make these Franken bikes where I would ride them around the block you know, until they fell apart and hopefully I came home in one piece. So this has been, you know, the essence of who I am and what I wake up to do from as, as long as I can remember. Now, my shadow spark type is the scientist. The work of the scientist is to solve problems, to answer complex questions. You know, like we are the puzzle masters. So what's interesting is for me, these two work together in a really powerful way. And in fact, a lot of entrepreneurs I've found actually have this pair and it makes sense. Okay because you're working to build something. And as you're building this thing along the way, what happens? We hit roadblocks, we, we stumble all the time. So we hit a point where the path isn't clear. So what do we have to do? Then we shift into scientist mode. We're like, okay, so there's a tool or a process or a spreadsheet, whatever it may be that doesn't exist, that I don't know about, that needs to be solved, that needs to be figured out for me to jump back into the process of creation. So I put on my scientist hat and I start problem solving, problem solving. Here's the interesting thing. One of the ways that I know that I'm a maker primary and not a scientist primary is the minute I have figured out the solution that I need to go back to the process of making, I'm done. I don't keep pursuing the question just for the fun of it, just for the joy of figuring the thing out, which a true scientist, a scientist as a primary would do. So I do that in service of being able to make better, cooler, bigger, more impactful things. So that's sort of, you know, the way that it unfolds in in my life. And that's what, you know, as we built this tool, you know, it was really, can we create a tool that's available to anybody? The tool is free, by the way, and um, and share it, you know, and really allow people to understand what's happening on a deeper level so that they can understand themselves, their preferences, this really deeper level driver and make choices from a much more informed, much more personal, much more aligned place. Mm. Now, I want to point out that these have been your drivers in a number of different businesses. So yeah. this is something that you've carried through in every creation that you've had by way of the work that you do. Now, one of the things that you say is that when we discover our sparker type and mine, uh, and now if you're watching, I'd really like to know what yours is. Mine is uh, the maven and my shadow is the sage. Mm. Um, That's a very popular pairing, by the way. It's not a popular pairing? No, it is. It is. Oh, it is a popular pairing. Okay. Yeah. Um, um, what I was going to say is that you say that when we discover our sparker type, that it's like a light bulb turns on and then stays on 
for life. So does that mean our spark type doesn't change? It's not like a personality thing. Yeah. Um, from all the research that we've done so far, you know, I, I will never say never because, you know, we continue to deepen into the research and we'll be doing a whole bunch of follow on research over the next year and couple of years. Um, going deeper and deeper and, and mining some pretty nuanced data. We have a, a huge number of people have already completed the assessment and it's allowing us to see this incredible international data set. So we will keep going deeper into that and deeper into new surveys and studies. Um, but from what we're seeing so far, the answer is yes. This looks like it's something that is stable through life. Mm. So, you know, as I mentioned, you know, I've known that I was this, I, I had this wiring since I was a kid. I didn't necessarily, um, I wasn't able to put language to it. You know, if you had asked me when I was 12 years old what I am, I probably wouldn't have said I'm a maker. Um, <laughs> but clearly, this has been a through line for my entire life. We have somebody on our team our, um, who's our, our lead operating person. And she is, uh, her spark type is the essentialist. So the essentialist, the fundamental work, is you make order from chaos. You look yeah. at the world I and you just, it. right. <laughs> You want to organize, you see big complex systems and you just, you are you, the funnest thing in the world. The thing that fills you is you want to dive into it. You want to create systems, processes, spreadsheets. You want to order simplicity, which is funny because for me, I almost can't understand how that would be enjoyable for somebody. <laughs> but then, but then I know I have this person on our team where she absolutely loves it and she is incredible at it. And when she can spend the vast majority of her time doing that, that is when she's nourished. Now, here's the interesting thing. When she was a kid, she used to line up her stuffed animals in height and color order. <laughs> so, so like most of you know, the archetypes, these express themselves in ways that we don't really think about very often, very early in life. And as soon as we have language for it, there's this recognition of like, oh, wait a minute. Now I can, I can literally look back through the entire through my life and see how this has been, you know, as a central driver for so much of what I've done and how very often too, when I've wandered away from doing the work of my sparkotype and spend almost no time doing it, I get really unhappy. I get frustrated. I become empty and unfulfilled. And this helps explain a lot of where that's coming from. All right. Well, I have a couple of questions about that because say you've made an investment, um, you've studied to be an architect or an accountant or an interior designer, you, I've invested years and I've become really good at this thing, even great, and this is what I'm known for. So abandoning that seems like, especially when we get to a certain age, seems yeah. kind of steep. Can we turn things around without sort of throwing everything out the window? Yeah, absolutely. In fact, the last thing that anyone would need to do is, is very likely throw it out the window. That's always the option of last resort, especially when we're further into life. You know, like mm -hmm. I'm 53 years old. I'm married. I have a teenage daughter. The last I live in New York City. The last thing that I need to do is blow up my living, you know. <laughs> and so but here's the really interesting thing about the spark type. Once you know what yours is, it not only helps explain so much of what's filled you up and emptied you out about whatever it is that you've done to build your living to date, it also helps inform how to do more of the things in whatever profession you've chosen will fill you up and less of the ones that empty you out. So in the professions that you just named, like architect, for example, you know, if you think about it, there are 10 different sparkotypes. Every sparkotype can be fully and healthfully and constructively expressed as an archetype. Or, or as an architect, you know, you, but it's the different aspects of that profession that represent the different sparkotypes. So, you know, the maker side is the idea of coming up with an idea and making these incredible plan blueprints, mapping it out. And then if you're in the building side too, building it, you know, there's a ton of problem solving that has to go on. The essentialist is all about creating simplicity from complexity. So as you go along through the different types of, of sparkotypes, what you see is that um, with rare exception, every spark type can be expressed pretty fully in nearly any profession or business when you actually understand what it is, and then you make the choice to be intentional and say, okay, so now I know the, the, the elements of this that really fill me and the elements that empty me. Let me reorient my work so that I'm doing so much more of the parts of it that nourish me 
and as little as possible of the parts of it that empty me. There, that is so powerful, and and I have actually heard you speak about this idea before. So, no matter what your business is, no matter what your role is that you've invested time and energy in, that when you fully understand your sparkotype, you can come at that same thing, but from your best self. Um, very, very, very powerful. Um, I think the example you used was one of a doctor uh, yeah. in. Story I heard and you could have any one of the, so I just want people to get that you can have any one of the sparker types but once you know what it is you will approach what it is that you do with purpose and passion yeah, um, to let you understand what part of it fills you and what part of it empties you yeah and that is like not really, the part you do. right double down on the part of it that really nourishes you um, and and it's incredibly freeing because for the vast majority of people you don't need to disrupt yourself. You don't need to blow anything up. You don't need to make big change. You just need to start doing more of what fills you and less mm. of what empties you. Mm. When you say don't get motivated, get aligned, what no. do you mean? So when you look at the world of motivation, um, generally people look at motivation as either a carrot or a stick. You know, what <laughs> right. motivates you to do something? Well, it's either... You're, you're have a carrot dangled out in front of you and you're reaching for it, something you desire, you know, or there's the stick behind you and that's a source of pain that you're trying to move away from. So when you look in the context of business and a lot of motivational theory, it's very often some blend of that, you know, and there are other parts of motivation theory that talk about this thing called intrinsic motivation. Mm. And that's less about a carrot and a stick. And what that is more about is, is it's about alignment. So what you find is that when you align your, your goal or the work that you do on a day-to-day -day basis with the thing that you feel put on the planet to do, then you don't need a carrot. You don't need a stick because you wake up in the morning feeling that you have the opportunity to spend as much energy as humanly possible just doing the thing that's deeply engaging, makes you feel completely on purpose and fully expressed. And it's almost like the bigger challenge is motivating you to stop doing that at the end of the day. You know, this is when we get trapped in sort of like the rabbit hole of we are so engaged, we're so dropped into flow, we're so we're, we're so deeply connected to that thing that we're doing that, you know, it comes eight o'clock at night and somebody else has to tap you on the shoulder and say, um, remember you had a life outside of this? You have a family, you have health and, and hobbies and other things that you love to do and to be outside. And this is, you know, this is where you tend to drop more readily uh, into this state that's known as flow, where you become absorbed in the activity, you lose a sense of time, you lose a sense of disconnection from the thing. And it's almost like you're just completely absorbed in this otherworldly state of bliss. And when you can work in that state, not only is it incredibly nourishing on a personal level, it's also um, incredibly productive, incredibly creative. So your cognitive, your creative, and your productive um, capabilities really raise to the highest possible level. So it's you operating at your best level. And that means that your overall performance raises substantially too. Right. And so that's what it looks like when you're doing spark aligned work. Um, as business owners, especially in small business, we're so often having to do other things <laughs> than what really lights us up. Um, and perhaps we don't have someone that we can offload it to. How do we think about our entire role uh, so that we do feel aligned and not resentful that there is all this other stuff? Yeah. So, and so this is the classic startup founders dilemma, right? Is that especially if you are, you know, if you're, if you're, bootstrapped, if you're self-funded, if you don't have other people's money, if that allows you to start with a team, which is most entrepreneurs, then yes, you know, like oh, one minute during the day, you're doing this thing you love to do and you're amazing at. And the next minute, you know, like you're cleaning the bathroom and the next minute, you know, you're, you're, you're putting out the signs and the flyers out front. The next minute you're cold calling and whatever it may be. So part of the startup, you know, the founder's dilemma is that in the early days, we just don't have the resources to have somebody else do the parts of the, of the job or all the different jobs that empty us. So what do we do? Well, in the early days, part of the, the bargain that you're making when you become an entrepreneur is that you are going to actually take on work that you don't love doing. You know, 
the, the goal is, though, to say, yes, I understand this is part of what I'm saying yes to when I'm starting a company, when I'm self-funding and not raising money to bring in other resources immediately. But part of that bargain, too, is to say what I'm shooting for, like my goal is by the time I hit three months or six months or nine months or a year, you know, like my goal is to be generating enough revenue so that I have the resources now to start to bring in either either outsource or bring in employees um, to start to pick up the parts of the work that needs to be done that is not the work of my Sparkotype. And then you find the work that is the furthest away from the work of your Sparkotype. And those are the people that you start to outsource or hire first so that you can slowly start to peel away the work that you, you know, that empties you and give it to other people. Now, here's a really, really important thing, though. When you're bringing those people in, whether it's a freelancer or you're outsourcing it or it's an employee, it's really important to actually know what their spark type is, to know what fills them and empties them. Because as you're handing off the work that empties you, you want to know that that same work is work that fills them so that you can all function in your own sort of individual zones of genius and really feel like you're all doing the work that you're here to do. And that way, you don't have to sit there constantly worrying, how do I motivate? How do I push people to do more? How do I make them work better? Everyone's doing it because it's the thing they wake up in the morning loving and yearning to do. And that allows everything to function on a completely different level. That is very powerful for us as leaders to, as you said, to have not only the inner focus, but also that outer focus where we are considering um, who we're with, whether it's a supplier, a contractor, a virtual assistant, or our, you know, CFO, um, that we can use this model as a way to, like you said, have everybody lit up, no matter what the role is, <clears throat> that they are doing their best work. That's very, very powerful. Um, what would you like to leave us with? I don't um, want to let you go, but what would you like to leave us with? Because <laughs> um, I love this conversation. <laughs> yeah, no, it, it's always great to connect with you. You know, I, I think the deeper thought here is, like, look, we've been developing this this one tool and, and set of tools around the sparkotypes, whether it's the sparkotype, um, whether it's whatever your process of self-discovery is. I think the invitation is make learning more about yourself a priority in what you do. We tend to really struggle with decisions. You know, how do I say yes or no to something? How do I know when I should, you know, take an opportunity or walk away from it? And I've heard this word decision fatigue floated around yes. a lot recently. Mm -hmm. I don't really believe that we're suffering so much from decision fatigue. What I believe that we're suffering from is a lack of self-knowledge. Because, you know, we can't understand what to say yes or no to personally in our businesses, in our lives, unless and until we know ourselves well enough to really understand why we're saying yes or no to something. So, you know, like whether you discover your sparkotype and go deeper into some of the tools that we have, whether you do any other assessment or personality quiz, take a course, work with a coach, whatever it may be, just make a commitment to set aside a little bit of time every day, every week, every month to go deeper into yourself, to, to initiate a process of self-inquiry so that as you begin to move forward in the world, in your relationships, in your business, in your life, you do so from a place of more intentionality and wisdom about what will really fill you up um, so that you can craft something that is allows you to exist at that sweet spot, you know, where you feel like you are doing the thing you're here to do. You're, you're lit up. You're, you're radiating a certain energy that affects not just you, but, but everybody who is in that sort of gravitational force around it. Um, because life is short, you know, this is this is it like we're, we're not here to just sort of like exist in what Teddy Roosevelt called the great twilight that needs knows that knows neither victory nor defeat you know we're here to participate um and that starts with knowing ourselves better Jonathan thank you so much for joining me yeah it's my pleasure thanks for having me I hope you enjoyed this interview with Jonathan Fields. This is my second interview with him and I have to say I just love spending this time with him. He has such valuable information and he just comes from the right place with his business. He's very mission driven. 
I wanted to say, if you're hearing a little bit of popping with my microphone, I'm using a different setup today. So I'm hoping that hasn't been annoying for you. <laughs> and hopefully uh, next episode, I'll be back on my usual setup um, and uh, it all sounding regular. I want to talk about the Sparkotype test. I did this. I loved it. In fact, I upgraded and bought the full report. You get a fantastic report um, when you do the test. And it is not difficult, but it's very thorough. And when you look at his report as an example of a download or a lead magnet, you have to love it. It's beautifully designed. It's beautifully worded. It's very on brand. Uh, So even if for that reason, get the report just to get a great example of what it's like to create an amazing marketing piece. But take the test because it does reveal the essential nature of the work that you're here to do. And once you discover it, there's an immediate intuitive kind of knowing of feeling like you're coming home. And there's an undeniable truth that it might explain some of the past choices that you've made, how you got to be where you are today. And that really empowers you to contribute to the world on a very different level. Um, So go ahead and get the test at goodlifeproject.com forward slash sparkotypes. And that's spelt spark e types t-y-p-e-s but to make it real easy and to give you a connection not only to sparkotypes but also to jonathan's website and his podcast and all those things head on over to herbusiness.com forward slash 117 that's herbusiness.com forward slash 117 now speaking of things that make you come alive one thing that has never done that for me is networking events But having a network of people around you is so important. And I pride myself on my network and my ability to reach out to people, whether I want to get a referral or I need an introduction. Maybe I've got a new product or service that I'm bringing to market and I want to get the word out, or maybe I need some advice or I need a tip or I need a resource. I always have a ready-made group of people that I can go to. And some of these relationships I've built over years and years and years, some are newer relationships, but to each one of those people, I'm very connected. But when we recently interviewed, um, uh, interviewed, surveyed, I meant, um, women in our community, uh, we were doing a free course. And these were women who were not part of our membership, but who were part of the general community. And we were asking them about growing their network and getting new clients. And what happened was they started to talk about hating networking and feeling fearful about showing up and feeling awkward and embarrassed or having had terrible experiences where they just got talked at or, you know, um, pinned to a corner and, you know, um, couldn't get away. And they just felt icky about the whole thing. And what happened was I worked with them for just over a week. And by the end of it, I could see the transformation. They were confident in their skin. They were sharing with each other. They were connecting. They were setting up coffee, coffee dates and coffee meetings. And the difference between one and the other was what I taught them that we teach inside of the Her Business Network about growing your network and getting new clients. And so what I have is a free networking quiz for you. It's called What's Your Networking Personality? And what it does is it reveals your natural tendencies when it comes to developing business relationships. And it highlights your strengths and the opportunities that are available to you without you having to be anyone else, without ever feeling awkward, but really playing to your natural style. Now, you might say, well, my natural style is to be isolated and um, awkward and introverted. That's okay. I've got something for you as well. Because the thing is, when you have a couple of tools in your toolkit and you have some guidance, you can move away from isolation towards being more connected just with the right people. You don't have to know a lot of people. You just want a few people who can open doors for you that are close to everyone else. It also moves you away from like now and then being able to get a deal across the line, but really not feeling connected and spending a lot of time with a lot of tire kickers. So you want to head on over to herbusinessquiz.com. It takes just a couple of minutes to do the quiz and I send you a report. And in that report um, are clues to how to create a rich and ready-made network of people based on your strengths. So we look at the pros and cons of each of the personalities because there's always, you know, two sides. And then we look at, well, being who you are, um, what can you do? How can you reach out? What's going to be comfortable for you, but still get you the results? How do you clearly communicate your value so that you can charge the prices you need to charge and ask for the sale when the time comes? Because so often we blunder that opportunity. And it means that your connections are going to get you more clients faster and without um, hassle and with less cost. All that 
is available for you once you go to herbusinessquiz.com and do the quiz. And I send you the report and then the supporting materials that I've put together for you. Because not being connected is so painful. There was actually some research done. It was in a Forbes article about the biggest um, reason that a lot of businesses are not successful is not some of the things that you think. It's the isolation and the loneliness that the owner feels. And so it's my mission <laughs> to counter that and give you ways to, no matter if you're introverted, if you're young or you're old, you're experienced or you're not, you're new in business or you're very experienced, to be able to re- create a rich network around you without having to go to networking events. How about that? <laughs> so uh, that is that. Um, That is what we have for you today. I want to thank Jonathan Fields for being an incredible guest. If you enjoyed this episode of Her Business, then do tune in next week. Be sure to subscribe to get the next episode. And I would really appreciate it if you tell your friends. I want to get the message out and share these incredible guests. And there's lots more coming up with as many women as possible. And if you would like to get a shout out here on the show, then leave a review on Apple Podcasts. And remember to tell me your name and your company name so that I can call you out. I'll look you up. I'll see what you do. I'll say something really nice about you (laughs) to say thank you. So thank you so much for being here with me today. Join me next time on the Her Business Podcast. Bye for now.